talk for, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes or something like that, and then just open it up for questions. So, you know, if, and if something comes up, just, just jump right in. So <laughs> as y'all know, I tend to ramble. <laughs> um, all right. So we live. Yeah, we're good there. We are live. Yeah. So food, which I guess prim primarily we're going to be talking about food today, but um, when we open it up, we can talk about other stuff beyond that. But, um, and as I was getting ready for this, I didn't even really know where to start because food, food reactivity, what, what food can do to the body, it's almost easier to say what, what can't it do to the body. So it's a lot more than just calories. In medical school, we were kind of taught you need this much carbohydrate, this much fat, this much protein, and that's that, and that's a balanced diet. It, it's a lot more than that. So actually, the molecules and what they do to the body and how they interact with our DNA controls so much, I, I can't even begin to say it. And almost any symptom that you can think of, fatigue, muscle pain, joint pain, headaches, skin rashes, and, and, the, and the list goes on. I, I've had cases where it was an underlying food that was actually doing that. And so, and, and I'm biased. I think most of you heard my story where um, dairy is a big issue for me. I was steroid dependent pretty much all my life until I figured that out after reading one of Dr. Andrew Wiles books that actually said if you have, you know, asthma, eczema, you know, allergies, cut dairy out of the diet. I was very skeptical about that because I thought, well, I've had diet, uh, you know, dairy at the time pretty much every day of my life. And I thought, well, it does a body good and it's, it's your vitamin D and it's your calcium. And, and so I almost was in disbelief when I read that. And I thought, what have I got to lose? I'm on all these medicines. I was taking a whole ton of medicines at, at the point, including steroids. And so I gave it a shot, cut dairy out. Within one week, my eczema was almost gone. I mean, it was certainly a lot better, even without using the topical steroids. And after about three weeks, I was so much better. I threw my Advair and my Flovin and my Betamethasone in the trash can. I mean, it was a night and day. And that, that really, for me, that's when the light bulb went off because that happened at the end of my third year in medical school. And so here at the time I'm thinking, Oh, I'm almost a doctor. I kind of have a handle on health and no, you know, we're, we're missing a, a lot, you know, and, and food is really a big issue. So, um, so with any kind of health issue that I'm dealing with, I'm always going to think could there be a hidden food, you know, that, that's playing a role there. So, um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that food, we say it's the greatest stressor to the human body and basically stress you can think of in terms, not necessarily like an emotional stress, but stress is the work that the body has to do. So with every single molecule of food, as we eat it and it's being digested and processed and, and going through the gut, that's a lot of work. I mean, that, that's trillions of molecules every day that are, that the immune system in the gut is having to process. And so it's looking at all these things and trying to decide who are you? What are you? Are you good for me? Do I let you into the bloodstream? Are you an enemy? Do I have to, you know, defend against you? And the amount of work that that takes for our body in, in any given normal day in, in a person's life is actually more work than the systemic immune system in the bloodstream does in an average human's lifetime. So quite literally, even doing like a one day water fast is lowering the workload on the immune system by almost a lifetime, uh, which is one of the reasons why if people do, you know, water only fasting. They usually, I mean, aside from cravings and, and fatigue, they normally will feel great. Um, one of the things that I'll mention with that is the antigenicity of a food, meaning what it's done to the immune system stays with us for about four days. So even if we're regular and we eat the food and the food is gone within 24 hours, the residual effect on the immune system actually persists for days after that. And so that also means if a person is eating a food which is a hidden intolerance, if they're having that food even twice a week, you know, say on a Wednesday and Sunday, the reaction their body's having to it is essentially 24-7. And that, that can play a big role in hidden food allergy because those are foods people are eating and they're like, I'm, I'm eating that, I'm fine. And maybe not, 
you know, it really could be contributing to an underlying issue, you know, whether it's fatigue or, again, almost, you know, name the symptom. So, um, so next I wanted to jump into one of the things that makes this so confusing is we know that there's many different physiological mechanisms that can contribute to the food reaction. And that makes it almost maddeningly complex. And even in the, oh, yeah. I know you're doing so well, <laughs> but I do have, when, say, uh, you don't drink milk ever, because I don't ever, but you use it to make something, the chemical change that that goes through, uh, say, milk mm -hmm. or sour cream, if you put it in a recipe, or um, uh, whipping cream, well, whipping cream would be pretty heavy. Cottage, cottage mm -hmm. cheese, I mean cheeses, if you put it in recipe, uh, it's going through some kind of you know, chemical thing when it's baking, cooking, and all that. Does that change that if you're allergic to it in any way, or is it still you're allergic, you're allergic, you don't care if you cook it, fry it, or whatever? It does change it. And, and so I've seen patients that would react to raw carrots, cook carrots, no problem. And usually when we're, um, so when, when I say antigen, are people kind of familiar with that, with that term? And, and as, a, as a broad term, I would say an antigen is a molecule that the immune system is capable of recognizing. So, and that can be anything. That can be pollen, it can be dust mite, it can be food, it can be bacteria. So it's, when we say antigen, it's just something that the immune system can, can see and, and recognize. So most oftenly they're proteins, not always, but, but most commonly. And proteins change, they literally denature when we cook them. Um, so you are changing the three-dimensional structure of the protein. And quite often what the immune system is, is actually going is, is seeing almost like a lock and key mechanism is the three-dimensional structure. If, if the the, let's just say antibody it has a certain structure and the antigen has a certain structure and they mesh, that's, that's where the magic happens or that's where the problem happens depending on, on what it is. But if you cook the food and you change the structure, all of a sudden it doesn't, it doesn't mesh anymore. And that can go both ways. So it's not always raw food that's a problem. But yes, but but cooking changes that, and, and that's yet another level of complexity that, that makes it difficult. But the, the more I talk, the more you'll realize, wow, we I mean, we don't even really fully understand everything that's going on, and that's what makes it so confusing. But, so, um, if it, so if you're, say you, because I have quite X amount of time, and you don't do dairy, but you cook it, then perhaps you're okay? Or? I've noticed with myself personally, because because dairy still is my nemesis, because I crave it. I always joke with people and say Mexican food is not the same without cheese and sour cream. <laughs> um, I, I will have my worst issues with milk, and I've tried all of them. I've tried, you know, the A1, the A2, the raw Sea Island Jersey cow, unpasteurized, the best of the best, the organic Greek yogurt, um, milk, yogurt, cream, sour cream, heavy cream, those flare me up bad. That, those are, even a, even a small indiscretion, and two to three days later, I'm gonna have changes in my skin, thick nasal mucus, worsening of other allergies. If I play with my dogs, I'll actually itch and, and hive up and everything. Cheddar cheese doesn't seem to do that to me as bad. So I think it's a more highly processed cheese. It might denature the proteins that I'm reactive to. So I've noticed a little bit of, of difference, even you know, with myself and in, in what types of dairy are worse you know, than, than others. But, um, and it, you know, if I was, if I had self-discipline, I'd just cut it out altogether. But you know, it's. it's yeah, I've tried raw milk. That it 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 all really except for like the really highly processed like like cheddar sharp cheddar cheese. I can I can usually get away with that. And and normally if I'm go, if I know I'm going to have dairy, if we're going to have Mexican food, and I'm going to put a little sour cream on it. If I take my digestive enzyme, which is very dairy specific, and I limit the amount that I have, 
if the enzyme completely digests those proteins, again, now the structure is different. They, it's, I, I think of it like scissors. The enzymes literally snip it up into little pieces. Well, now it's invisible to the immune system. So there, there are, before I went through functional medicine training and learned how to cheat, <laughs> and exposure to dairy would, would usually flare me for about three weeks. And that was enough of a nuisance to where I really was being completely strict dairy free. Going through functional medicine, they teach you the four R's of healing the gut, which is remove, replace, re-inoculate, and repair. Remove is doing the detective work to see what's causing a problem. And, and there's a million different ways of doing that, you know, elimination diets, blood tests, skin tests, you know, there, there's, but that's always detective work trying to find what's causing a problem in the first place. Replace is usually stomach acid, bile, and pancreatic enzymes. So if any of those three things are not adequate, they can all be supplemented. So stomach acid you can replace with betaine hydrochloride is the strongest way to do that. Um, apple cider vinegar tablets can actually help and on a milder level. You can replace bile with ox bile. I don't really know if it comes from an ox. I kind of hope it doesn't, but <laughs> that's what they call it. Um, digestive enzymes are mimicking pancreatic enzymes. So for, and, and what I found is most of us, by the time we hit about 40, we're not making half the stomach acid we had when we were in our 20s. And the, the acidity in the stomach is very important because it, it, it can kill off negative bacteria. It can keep the upper small bowel kind of sterilized so that can kind of prevent small bowel bacterial overgrowth or, or SIBO. Um, mineral absorption is, is critical. Acidity is important for mineral absorption. So anyone who's even on an acid reducer like Nexium, things like that, we will worry if they're on it long term. Even if they're taking calcium, they're going to get calcium deficient and magnesium deficient and all these. And, and so that's that's an area where, you know, if I see someone, they're like, oh, I've been on Nexium for 20 years. Ah, you know, that, that really raises a red flag for me because of what it's going to do to the bones. Um, protein digestion really it starts in the mouth, but it really have an adequate acidity in the stomach goes a long way towards that. And so, um, so that's important. Bile is important for fat digestion and for bacterial balance in the gut. And then if pancreatic enzyme production isn't as adequate as it should be, um, digestive enzymes can go a long way to prevent it. So all three of those things can be supplemented. And if any of those was an issue for that person, usually that step can be a game changer because digestion improves significantly, mm -hmm. nutrient absorption improves significantly, and then that translates over time into, into overall health, you know, just, just being a lot better. So, um. Um, what about um, uh, milk-free products, you know, like So Delicious and Lactaid and stuff? Depending on the product, um, I think some of those are good. Mm -hmm. Some of those to get the mouth feel of like a whole milk will include carrageenan, which is an algae derivative, yeah. and carrageenan tears most people up. I mean, it will create leaky gut. It'll, and what you'll see on there, sometimes they'll just put like natural additives. Um, that can be carrageenan. Sometimes they're honest and they just put carrageenan on the label, but I always look for that because I do think that one is also another one that affects people. If you're not allergic so. to that, though, then. And, and some people do okay with it. And so it, and, and it's always kind of trial and error. So if mm -hmm. someone says, oh yeah, I've turned, you know, sure enough, dairy is a problem, but now I'm using, you know, almond milk or rice milk or cashew milk yeah. and I seem to be doing fine, then hopefully, okay. hopefully they're good. So, um, mm -hmm. so let's see. So that, so the, to finish out the four R's, the third R is re-inoculate and that usually is probiotics, prebiotics, fermented foods. I, so much research now is going into the health of the, the balance of the microbiome, which is not just bacteria. We always think bacteria, but it looks like there's 10 times more viruses in the gut normally than there are bacteria. A lot of those are bacteriophages that literally are preying on certain bacterial species. And you're going to be hearing a lot more as we, the bacteriophage technology was, was really kind of being developed and looked at in the 1920s. 
and then as the antibi as penicillin was discovered and we got in the antibiotic era, they almost totally forgot about bacteria phage therapy. Well, now that more and more antibiotics are becoming resistant and no longer effective, bacteria phage technology is really getting a lot more scrutiny. And there's companies like Life Extension that actually are providing probiotics that include bacteria phages. And bacteria phages are viruses that attack and destroy certain bacteria. So basically it it, it makes good sense that if you were adding in a probiotic that contained several species of beneficial bacteria with bacteriophages that are also going to kill the not so good bacteria, that's a that you're going to get a better result than than just flooding in the bacteria alone. But um, can you explain more about what a prebiotic versus a probiotic is? So basically, a prebiotic is anything that feeds the good bacteria, and in general, it's vegetable fiber. Pretty much it looks like the, the most beneficial bacterial species in the gut are vegetarians. So in, in the perfect world, if you have a pretty healthy balance of bacteria in the gut and you're feeding them vegetables, and, and then there's, there's certain prebiotic fibers that get more pressed than others. So inulin is a big one. Um, Jerusalem artichoke is very high in a lot of prebiotics, including uh, inulin. Um, they're literally feeding the lactobacillus family, which is a beneficial family, sometimes at the extent of the not so good bacteria. Um, one company that's really working with this right now, which is a direct to consumer, is called Biome, um, B I O M E. And they basically uh, will send you a little kit. I believe it's, it's like a Q tip swab stool sample. So you basically just swab, use toilet paper, and send it back to them. They will characterize the microbiome with PCR and then basically say, here's your good families, here's your not so good families, here's your commensals. Those are kind of considered either we don't know, they haven't been studied, or they're not, we don't know if they're good or bad, but they're there. And then it'll tell you, usually with diet, this is what you can do to boost the ones you want to boost, this is what you can do to lessen the ones you want to lessen. And then they typically recommend retesting a month or two down the road. And I've had some patients that using that, they saw, you know, measurable, actionable changes where they could improve the microbiome. And usually the healthier the microbiome, the healthier everything else is, you know, the better the immune system is and all that kind of stuff. So um, the research into this stuff is just exploding and we're going to be seeing more and more. You know, it's, it's really fascinating stuff. But, and then the last R is repair. And usually that doesn't mean that there's been like actual damage, but there may just be kind of leaky gut or, or an increase in permeability of the gut membrane. And if that's the case, you really want to seal that barrier back up. There's about 200 nutrients that you can use to do that. Um, my current three favorites, the ones that, that I'm using when I need it, is L-glutamine, Restore, and George's aloe. Those have just kind of become my go-tos. And, and part of that um, slippery elm, for instance, as a fiber, is very healing for the gut, for, the, for both the esophagus, the stomach, the, the gut, it does a lot of good stuff. But our allergy patients, especially like a really highly sensitive allergy patients, they can be allergic to slippery elm. And so with a lot of the, uh, and, do you mind if I tell a story about you? No. So, <laughs> so I flared her up with psyllium fiber. Actually, I think you're the only person that I've seen that had that reaction. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm a big fan of psyllium. It's psyllium. It's, it's a fiber. It's good for the gut. It's good for regularity. But at one time, I recommended it for you, and, and you flared. And I thought, oh, my gosh, psyllium fiber. So, it, you know, it can be anything. But um, I haven't really – I can't say that I've ever seen any negatives – with glutamine, Restore, George's aloe. So um, those have kind of become my go-tos. There's, there's many others, you'll see. And there's even formulas on the market that are like combination formulas. We have one called permeability factors that has a lot of different things in there that are good for the gut that works well for, for a lot of people. But um, So those are in, in functional medicine. They, they kind of tell you about the four R's of healing the gut. And they usually say with any health problem that you're trying to address, 
heal the gut, heal the gut, heal the gut. They really kind of, and, and they're right. I mean, Hi Hippocrates got it right thousands of years ago that really, you know, all health and disease begins in the gut. So uh, let's see where we, yes. I have to say to these people, that he saved my life. <laughs> Getting there. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, a lot better. So, yes. And I'm thrilled. That's what makes this job for me fun and, and satisfying is seeing people get better. You know, if you can help somebody with something, it's just, it just, it makes life worthwhile. So um, thank you for saying that. But, um, okay, so mechanisms, let's jump into that. So the, the actual physiologic mechanisms that can constitute a food reaction are many. And I feel pretty confident in saying that we, we know we don't know everything that's going on. It's so complex. Immunology. Um, this was the book, this is a new edition, but this was the book that we primarily used when I was in medical school. Um, fascinating stuff. I bought the latest edition when I joined this practice just because I wanted to see what had changed. I couldn't believe how much it changed. And immunology, it seems like the more they study it, it's like the medical knowledge doubles almost every year. And I mean, they're finding new types of cells that we didn't even know existed. Um, lately, there's been a lot of push um, looking at a white blood cell called a T regulatory cell. And the T regulatory cells have a lot to do with tolerance. So anything that they um, have identified and identified that it's safe for us, they go a long way to communicating to the immune system, this thing's okay. And what we think in, when we do immunology, um, immunotherapy, where we're doing allergy shots or, or sublingual desensitization, one of the mechanisms is we're boosting the T regulatory cells to whatever antigens we're treating. And then at some point you actually get complete tolerance, you know, back to that thing. But so, so this is a gross oversimplification, but some of the mechanisms that are, that are at play are antibodies. And is everyone kind of familiar roughly with antibodies? I don't. So an antibody, most of them, not all of them look like a Y. So I, br I brought this in, but if everyone can see, it kind of, it's, it's literally kind of shaped like a line. Here's actually like a um, computer design drawing of what the protein actually looks like. But I've always thought of these kind of like a lobster. So you want me to pass it around for them? Yeah. yeah. So basically, the, the the two arms of the Y have claws on the end. And the claws are designed by the body to be ideally very specific for certain three-dimensional shapes. And if they bump into something that, again, like a lock and key they can recognize, they'll, they'll latch onto it. And specific, and then there's different uh, classes of antibodies that kind of each have their own role. But for the most part, you can think of those, like a lobster, those two claws, they bump into something, that they can recognize they're going to latch onto. With IgG, again, gross oversimplification, but if it bumps into something it recognizes and latches onto it, the tail of the lobster will send up a flag that waves to the, the, the Pac-Man cells in the immune system and says, I just caught something that's an enemy over here. You need to come gobble it up. And it actually comes over and it gobbles up the antibody and the thing that it's attached to and destroys it, basically digests it. So the benefit with that, this is kind of where memory in the immune system comes in. So if, if you, and I'm gonna say flu shot here, which I know is very <laughs> controversial, but ideally the, the idea, if someone goes and gets a flu shot, they're using the specific antigens that are on the flu particle so that the person's going to make antibodies, that the immune system's going to see it go, what is that? That's foreign. It's going to make an antibody to those antigens. And then once you have those circulating in the blood, if you actually got the flu, you've already got antibodies in your blood that can immediately latch onto it and have the Pac-Man cells come in and gobble it up. 
and then you're you're much less likely to have as severe of a flu infection may may not get sick from it at all versus someone who doesn't have those antibodies they get the flu their immune system has to see the flu go that's an enemy and then begin the process of making these antibodies which takes several days well by that time they're infected with the flu they're actually fighting the flu and then once the body has made enough of these antibodies to actually start latching onto it yeah, and that's kind of the difference between having the flu shot done maybe getting the flu and having a eh, one to two days of not feeling good versus not having a flu shot and getting you know seven days or eight days of, of misery so um there's a lot of negatives with vaccines too so I'll, I'll throw that out there but the, but that's the thought process behind that so with the different antibodies as it relates to foods i pay the most attention to two classes one is called and with antibodies we always call them ig and then another letter that's just immunoglobin which immunoglobin is just another term for antibody so ig class g is primarily a blood-borne antibody that circulates throughout our body which is made to things that we have seen before and is there to protect us against those things if we ever come into contact with it again. Um, IgE is an antibody that's primarily related to what we would call classical allergy or, or they also call it type one allergy. IgE actually attaches to the surface of a cell which is called a mast cell, M-A-S-T. Mast cells contain little granules of all different kinds of chemicals that are the mediators of the allergic reaction. So the IgE actually attaches to, it, it, it almost looks like a dandelion puffball, where you can think of it like a, like a ball that then has all these Ys attached to it all over the whole thing. What happens is if we come into contact with something that the IgE can recognize, if it cross-links, if you have these, these two IgE and they go like that, that flips a switch that degranulates the mast cell. So it, at that point, it literally releases all these granules. Um, histamine, serotonin, bradykinin, substance P, calicrin, and about 20 other mediators that are then going to do all the things that we would associate with both inflammation and with allergy. And so histamine is going to dilate the blood vessels. It's going to make um, portions of the capillaries, the smallest blood vessels, literally, I think of it like a submarine that has ports on the side of it. Histamine will open those ports. That allows fluid from the bloodstream, mainly the plasma, to leak into the tissue. And it allows certain white blood cells that are circulating through the body to actually leave the blood vessel and migrate into the tissue. So everything that, you know, if you get stung by a bee, for instance, and you get the redness and the swelling and all that, that's from a mast cell releasing all these mediators that are then going to allow this inflammatory response to happen. And it's an important response for healing. So, you know, if you sprain your ankle, if we did not have this inflammatory response, it wouldn't heal. You know, the damage would be permanent. So, so there is a real beneficial mechanism for it. But when it happens on exposure to a benign thing, like a food or dust or grass pollen, then it's creating this inflammatory response really for no good reason. And that's typically why we're trying to treat allergy. We're trying to tell the immune system, you're reacting to something that's not really a threat. Calm down, you know, you don't really want to do that. So the reactions with IgE tend to be very immediate. So this is where, um, someone is highly allergic to peanut and they eat a peanut and within seconds they're swelling, you know, potentially even to the point of anaphylaxis, they have to go to the ER, get a shot of epinephrine, that's IgE. That's also what um, pretty much any doctor would call food allergy, you know, classical food allergy. Um, and, and some of this is semantics because some of the reactions that we would still kind of consider food allergy, national allergy and asthma down the street would say, no, that's not allergy, but it's still an immune response. So it's kind of, I don't know what you want to, what name you'd want to put on it, but 
but IG is your classic immediate response. You can do blood panels uh, to look for IgE antibodies to look and see if, if you have high IgE to something, you should be allergic to that thing. And you can do food panels with IgE and environmental panels. Um, here in our area, they, they break the country up into different regions. We're considered um, area three, which is basically South Carolina, parts of Georgia. Um, LabCorp, an area three panel, will take all our major grasses, trees, the, the flora that's common in our region, our molds and all that, and give you an IgE level on that. And sometimes they say, we don't do a lot of that test, but that test is helpful for me if I've got someone who's anaphylactic to a lot of things, and I wanna know, you know, what of those are the worst things on the panel? Because those are even things I would not want to skin test because we could produce anaphylaxis. So it you know, protects, but most of the time we don't have to go looking for that because it's such an immediate reaction. People are coming to me saying, I can't eat peanut. You know, I can't eat shrimp. You know, if I have it, I'm reacting. And those are easy to figure out. You know, those are kind of no brainers. IgG, again, being a bloodborne antibody does not have that kind of reaction. So to form IgG to a food, which really shouldn't be there under normal circumstances, we think you have to have leaky gut. And I guess I should pause there. Is everyone kind of familiar with leaky gut? I know pretty much most of it, but you could think of it like the permeability of the gut barrier. So the, the cells that are lining the gut, really from the top down, but mainly in the small intestine, are being held shoulder to shoulder, side to side. So if they're like this, and let's just say this is the inside of the gut, and this is the bloodstream, for something to get from the gut into the bloodstream, it's either gotta go through the cell, in which case the cell's completely under control of what it lets through and what it does to it, or it might be able to squeak through this, this little gap in between there. So if it's like this, you know, you might be able to get a little particle like that big through something, but if it spreads out, say like that, you could get something that big from the gut into the blood. So as larger molecules are entering the bloodstream, that revs up the workload on the systemic immune system. And if foods, little, I mean, again, a molecule of an undigested food makes it into the bloodstream, it's probably gonna be seen as foreign because it's really not supposed to, and in the perfect world, with perfect digestion, fats should be broken down, and fats are kind of in a unique category. We don't see a lot of allergy to fat just because um, kind of how they're made. It, it, they're, they're a little bit special, but primarily with carbohydrates and proteins, carbohydrates should be broken down all the way into the simple sugars before they get in the blood, and proteins, which are made of amino acids, really should be primarily broken down into the simple amino acids before they're allowed into the bloodstream. So if that doesn't happen, so if there's leaky gut and an intact little molecule, let's say a blueberry, makes it into the blood, the immune system might see it, go, what is that? I don't, that's foreign, and it might make an IgG antibody to it, just like it would if you got the flu shot, it's kind of the same thing. And then once you've got IgG to blueberry floating around in your bloodstream, if you had blueberry, on a different day and you still had leaky gut and a little molecule makes it into the bloodstream, IgG is going to latch onto it, wave to Pac-Man and say, hey, we got a problem over here, come gobble me up. And, and it does generate some degree of an inflammatory response. It kind of revs up the immune system. The IgG mechanism for all that to happen, you got to eat the, you got to have the antibodies, you got to eat the food, you got to have leaky gut, the food has to make it undigested into the bloodstream. The antibody's got to find it and latch onto it. And all that takes time. So basically the mechanisms, the things that we're seeing that relate to IgG related symptoms are delayed. And I would say of all the blood testing, and we've got this from, from the all test, which is primarily who, who we're using now. Um, this is the one that I'm probably recommending the most because it's a delayed reaction, these are foods that can fool even an elimination diet. So 
elimination diets are still kind of considered the gold standard to try to figure out food allergy. And I love them, and I, well, actually I hate them, but <laughs> using them with patients, they're wonderful because you know, they're miserable, but, um, but I've had people figure out like some really, really important stuff doing that. But essentially, the IgG mechanism can fool an elimination diet because you can take the food out of the diet, maybe something good happens, maybe not. You can challenge the food back into the diet after a period of time, and, may, and if it's IgG, you might not react to it that day, and maybe not even the next day. It can happen up to four days. And so by the time the symptoms come back, you know, again, let's, let's say blueberry. So we take blueberry out of the diet, wait a period of time, challenge blueberries back into the diet, nothing happens. Three days later, horrible headache. That can still be from blueberry. But by that time, you've eaten other things, and it's very difficult to figure out that that's actually what it was. Mm -hmm. So usually with the IgG food panels, if any of those things are positive, those are foods I'll say, okay, go ahead and take those out. And again, we're just kind of looking to see the symptoms go away. And if they do, we know we're on to something. Um, the good news is this is not a permanent mechanism. These antibodies do eventually go away over time. So these are not foods that the person can never eat again, you know, ever in their life. But um, so that's IgG. What, mm -hmm. What's the difference between sensitivity and versus allergy? That's the semantics, really. And, and, and with so much of this, um, I don't think anyone would argue that the IgE, you know, your immediate reaction, everyone would agree that's food allergy. But if you eat a food and two days later you have joint pain, you could, I mean, we in this office would still call that food allergy, but you could also say, well, it's intolerance or sensitivity or, and, and I think that's part of the problem is just the semantics of the whole thing. Um, you know, and, and again, with delayed reactions, it, it's just, it gets so confusing, you know, what to call it. But um, case report with the IgG panel, and I, th I think this kind of illustrates something. I had a, actually a close friend of ours developed a rash mainly on her arms and on her chest. Um, went to several different dermatologists. They didn't really figure it out, but steroids would always take it away. Steroid pack, it would vanish, but then it would pop right back up after the steroid pack. She's a pharmacist. She basically says, I'm not just going to go on long-term steroids, you know, and, and we believe there is a cause for everything that happens. You know, there's an underlying cause. So, I dragged her in here kicking and screaming because she's neophobic and we did a lot of testing here, found a lot of stuff, actually had her like her sinuses and everything feeling a lot better, weren't really changing the rash. Asked her to do an elimination diet, didn't really turn everything up on the elimination diet, turns out we didn't do it long enough. But So then kind of out of desperation, I said, well, let's do the IgG food panel. So eggs were off the chart high. They raise chickens. So she was literally having eggs straight from the hen practically every morning. I said, all right, no eggs. So we cut out all eggs. Took 11 days for the rash to go away, but it completely vanished. That's why we missed it with the elimination diet, because I was just having her do a very basic one where, and again, because the antigenicity of a food stays with us for about four days, if you want to do a quicker elimination diet, you can eliminate the food group for five days or, or even six or seven if you want to go a little bit further. Um, so I was having her come off foods for about five days and if nothing happened, put them back in. And that's why we missed the eggs. If, if she had come off eggs for, you know, 11 days or more, we would have figured it out just with the elimination diet. So, but, so anyway, off the eggs, good clinical success. I'm asking her to put the stuff in to heal leaky gut, so we're doing the glutamine and the restore and all that kind of stuff. We gave it two months, and it was actually approaching Thanksgiving. And so she said, do you think I'm, can I challenge eggs back in? I said, what, and she wanted to eat this casserole that, that had eggs in it. And I was like, there's only one way to find out, give it a shot, you know? So she called me the next morning, guess what's back? <laughs> the rash, not as bad, but the areas where, oh, and, and this illustrates an important principle, but we say the previously injured organ becomes the target of the immune response or inflammatory response. So areas in the body that have been previously injured or have had previous inflammation will tend to manifest 
inflammation anytime there's there's an inflammatory response. And we'll I'll have you know people that will say, you know, I injured my knee playing football in high school 30 years ago, but now I've noticed if I eat beef the next day my knee hurts. So if they're sensitive to beef, beef's creating inflammation. Previous tissue that has manifested inflammation will tend to be where it manifests. That has to do with a pretty complex mechanism that don't have time to go into. But so the areas where the rash was will tend to be the areas where it will normally come back again. So I said, okay, we're not there. So we gave it five months. She actually no, no eggs, egg products or anything with eggs for five months. Challenged eggs back in, no problem ever since. And she's basically back to having eggs practically every morning again. And we normally recommend for, for allergy patients, especially food allergy patients, a rotation diet. The strict rotation diet is so stressful that I, I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm not saying it's not the right thing to do, but it stresses people to the gills. It's really, it, it's the hardest diet I think on the planet because to do it right, not only are you not having the food, but you're going to not have any cross reactive foods any more frequently than any fifth day. And so if you really, by the time you put the cross reactivity in there, you're eating weird stuff because there's nothing else to eat. You know I mean? You know, by day four, you're on okra and yak fat, you know, so <laughs> it's just crazy. So I don't, you know, unless someone's highly, highly brittle, I don't ask them to do that all that often, but cautious rotation, you know, like if someone wanted to have scrambled eggs, no more often than every fifth day, the likelihood that they would sensitize to it is, is a lot lower. So she said, yeah, I'm back to having eggs pretty much every morning, but Another important example here, when this happened, when it started, she had been going through a really stressful period at her work. Stress causes leaky gut. They've proven that now. So I think stress causes leaky gut. The fact that eggs were there every morning made it inevitable that eventually some are going to make it into the bloodstream. Voila, I think this. So I kind of told her, well, if you're having eggs every day now and you seem to be doing okay with it, just you know, as long as you're not under a major stressor, chances are hopefully it'll never, you know, pop back up. But so that, that's a good example how we use that test to figure something out. I thought they moved away from stress causing leaky gut and ulcers and things like that. Everything that, that I've lately looked at, they're more and more solid that, it, that yeah. Um, there's a question with stress and ulcers, but the, the mouse study that they did with it, they, they took a mouse, put him in a cage, shook the cage, banged loud noises around it, flashed a strobe light, just thoroughly, didn't hurt the mouse at all, but just thoroughly spooked the mouse for 20 minutes. It changed their gut as much as around the antibiotics. So, so stress, stress is a Stress is a killer. Does it go as far as affecting um, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's? I would say yes, just because I mean it, it. What's going on with like with chronic unrelenting or or severe stressors affects every system in the body, you know, to, and, and and typically in a negative way. Well, I mean, we're really I kind of believe the theory that we were meant to be able to run from the tiger, you know, but then one, if we make it back to the cave and we're safe you know, we get back to being hopefully normal and relaxed. But in today's world, a lot of us are under chronic, you know, and chronic low level, you know, traffic, taxes, terrorism, you know, gosh, if I turn the news on, I'm, you know, and we're really not meant to, our, our, our genetics hasn't caught up with that lifestyle. So I think a lot of the kind of chronic diseases that we're seeing are playing into the fact that our, our lifestyles now are not really the, you know, we're, we really should be out in the woods right now. So, but, um, quick note about IgA antibody. So this is yet another class of antibody. IgA is in the blood. It's also primarily on the mucous membrane. So literally from the mouth all the way down, IgAs are on the surface. They too are there to defend against stuff. Um, kind of a similar mechanism where if they latch onto something, they got it, and then other immune cells can come in and gobble it up. 
when it comes to food, I'll, I'll freely admit I, I don't. I haven't made my mind up what to do and what to recommend if we've done an IgA panel. Because if someone has IgA to a food, I don't know if that means they are protected against that food, they can eat that food, or they made an antibody to it, so maybe they are trying to defend against that food. And, and I literally, I change my mind on that all the time. And so because of that, I, I can't remember the last time I even measured an IgA panel, but, it, but it's because I don't know what to tell the person to do with the results. So um, I just kind of wave off. There's a cell mediated reaction that can take place with, which has nothing to do with antibodies. So that's yet another way that we can react. The test that we use to measure that if we're going to do one is called the MRT. That stands for the mediator release test. They basically will take the blood, separate the white blood cells in the lab into different wells, challenge foods into the different wells and see if they then release histamine and serotonin and all these mediators. It's, it's a slightly different reaction than what's going on with IgE and mast cells, but it's similar because it's still these mediators like histamine are being released. So it, it's a completely different mechanism. And that, again, is another area of frustration because you can have someone that will do a food IgG panel and an MRT panel, and they're going to say different things usually. And they'll say, this says I'm okay with something. This says I'm not. They're both real. They're, they're, both, they're two separate physiologic reactions. There really is no one test that can tell us the full piece of the puzzle. It would be so nice if that was the case, but I, I, this is what makes food so difficult as far as trying to you know, sort it all out. And then again, elimination diets are still probably considered the gold standard, but they can be fooled with delayed responses. So that's a little bit of a trick. The skin testing, when we actually, you know, skin test here for foods, we're seeing several of these mechanisms. We're seeing, you know, IgE, IgG, all of these things, whether it's an immediate response, delayed response. So it's pretty darn good, but I would even say even that isn't perfect. And, and for me, actually, with my issue with dairy, which I would really call more of an intolerance, when I skin tested dairy, I was fine. I was like a two. I mean, it's I'm, I'm not allergic to it, but when I eat it, two to three days later is when I flare. It's very delayed. And so I think basically for me, dairy always causes leaky gut. That lets more stuff in the bloodstream, revs up the immune system, and then I start getting more and more hyperactive to other things. So, um, so two quick stories, and then I'll pretty much just try to answer any questions. But, And I'm going to kind of paraphrase the first one because this is Dr. Lieberman's story. But several years back, I think this may have been like 30 years ago at this point, Dr. Lieberman still had admission privileges, I think, at, at Roper. And he had set up a room in the hospital that was kind of a clean room. So any patient of his that he admitted to there was going to get, you know, the air in the room was filtered. The water, you know, was also, you know, filtered pure water. The food would be as clean and pure as they could get their hands on. And so they tried to keep it in just a really clean room environment. And usually if you put someone in that environment, all kinds of stuff gets better. You know, you're taking away exposures to lots of different things. So he had that set up. A patient called that actually said, I I'm having joint pain. The joint pain is so bad, especially in my knees and my ankles, that I can't walk. Like my family is having to carry me to the bathroom. And he was a pretty big guy. And he said, I, I can't go on like this. You got to put me in the hospital. Dr. Lehman says, okay, we'll put you in the hospital. He says, now, this may be a food. You know, I'm, I'm most suspicious that a food could be doing this. So if you don't mind, we're going to fast you. He said, sure, doc. I'll do, you know, whatever you think. So, and he said, you know, it takes four days to clear usually, so we're so expect, we're probably gonna do about a five day fast. He said, sure doc, no problem. So every morning, Dr. Lehman's going in to round on him, and you know, day one, how you doing? No change. Day two, how you doing? No change. Day three, how you doing? No change. And, and up until that point, that's not all that surprising, because it can take all that time to clear. Well, finally comes in day five, kind of, you know, hoping, expecting to, to hear good results. How you doing? No change. So he says, well, 
Would you mind doing one more day? Sure, Doc. I'll mean, do whatever, whatever you think. Comes in day six. How you doing? No change. He says, well, now I'm starting to really sweat because here this guy's been sitting in a hospital room for almost a week. Do, you know, how miserable is that? Fasting, how miserable is that? He said, would you be willing to do one more day? Sure, Doc. No problem. Comes in to see him day seven. Nobody's in the room. Walks down to the nurse's station and says, where's Mr. So-and-so? Well, he was in there this morning. So they, they search the hospital. They call over the intercom, nothing. And Dr. Lehman's thinking, well, he may have just finally got frustrated and just left or whatever. So he goes back to his office, gets a call at his office. A couple hours later, patient's back in the room, jumps back in the car, gets back to the hospital, walks in the room. When he walked in the room, he said the patient literally, when he saw him, jumped out of bed and did a pirouette. He said, oh. <laughs> he was pain-free. Pain had completely gone away. And he said, where were you this morning? He said, Doc, you know, I've been stuck in this room. Once the pain was gone and I felt good, he said, I had to get out of here. So I actually, I went, I walked down by Colonial Lake, you know, down by downtown, <laughs> yeah. walked down through the market. It was a nice day outside. He said, I just, I, would, I just had to be outside or whatever. And he said, oh, well, this is great. Well, finally, we, we fixed it. And now we know it's a food. You know, and, and actually what a lot of people do say, if they if they get to day five, six, seven and, and completely clear and are feeling great, and sometimes with the fast, like the hunger will come in, like day one's usually not so bad, but day two, day three, hunger will get severe, cravings will get severe, sometimes people feel kind of flu-like, kind of achy. Um, day four, sometimes that continues, sometimes it's a little better, but then day five, when everything really clears, then usually people feel wonderful and they will say, I never want to eat again. Like I feel so good right now. I don't want to eat. So the guy said, I, I never really want to eat again. So you got to eat. You know, I said, well, I, I tell you what, let me, um, let me just go get you a salad from the cafeteria or whatever. So he brings him a salad. He took two bites of lettuce and the joint pain came back severely. He had been dieting. He's sensitized to lettuce. So it can be any food. It can be any trigger. And then here recently for me, this is probably about four months ago or so, I had a young patient, 12-year-old guy with autoimmune hepatitis. And one of our goals with that is to basically lower the total, you could say, inflammatory load or allergic load or immunologic load on the body so that hopefully the immune system gets back on point to where it's not hyperactive and especially it's not attacking that person's own tissue. So of course we always want to think could there be an underlying food that's I'm not necessarily saying is the cause of it, but could be an underlying hidden source of inflammation. Cruel joke. We will crave what we're sensitive to 90% of the time. So a lot of times I'll look at the, and then of course there's, there's usual suspect foods like gluten and dairy and corn and soy and things like that, that we're always suspicious for, but I'll look at people and say, what do you crave? You know, or, or what th now we all crave sugar. That's a survival thing. We're all kind of hardwired to crave sugar. But, um, so anyway, I looked at him, he's 12 years old. I'm expecting him to say pizza, cheeseburgers, ice cream, you know, something like that. And he said, broccoli. I was like, really <laughs> good for you. Yeah. I mean, I beg everyone to eat broccoli. This is awesome. Well, when we skin tested him here in this room, I mean, I'm not kidding that he wheeled to the size of a peach on broccoli. Wow. And so after lunch, we're meeting again. And I looked at the parents and said, I can't believe I'm actually going to say this. But for now, no broccoli. Um, so it, it, we can sensitize to any food, even a healthy food. And that really surprises a lot of people. But, um, so I think that's most of what I wanted to get through. So questions? You mentioned briefly the word prostrate activity. And I'm not sure people understand that. When you say ragweed, which is a pollen, for example, and cross-react with an avocado, which is a food, how is that possible? So thanks, because um, I did want to go into that. So, so again, most things, not all, most things with the immune system, especially antibody reactions, is like a lock and key mechanism. So it's a three-dimensional structure of something that the immune system can then recognize which determines both what we can defend ourselves against, but also what we may be able to be allergic to. And so a lot of things in nature have a similar three-dimensional structure. 
And if they do, if, if they're close enough, then it's something that could potentially cross-react. So in other words, an antibody that's very specific for oak could also cross-react with egg because there's a protein in both of them that, that looks very similar. And we usually call that molecular mimicry where, where things are different. But cross-reactivity comes into play in a big way, and, and, it's, and, and it's very confusing because the three-dimensional structure of what's called our human leukocyte antigens, which I think of as, as the hands, both on the antibodies and on the white blood cells that literally bump into things and recognize them, those structures are determined by our DNA. And there's several different types. So not, not all of us have identical hands on our white blood cells or our antibodies. So that comes into, into play with cross-reactivity too. But in general, as this has been studied, and, and Sue Killian, who's a researcher, did an entire book on allergy cross-reactivity. But for people that have the ability to have, and we all have the ability to have cross-reactivity, egg and oak, to use that as an example. If someone has scrambled eggs in December, they might be fine with it. If they have scrambled eggs in the spring when the oaks are pollinating and blooming, they might have a bad day, they might react. And it's because they're getting a double whammy of the antigen. And so one of the things that we test a lot here for foods is mesquite pollen, and we're using the pollen. Sue Killian found that mesquite pollen cross-reacts with 140 different foods. So the benefit of that to treat it is if, if using immunotherapy, if you desensitize someone to mesquite pollen, you're also indirectly giving them coverage against a lot of different foods, and that's a lot of bang for the buck. And um, so we're saying onion cross-reacts with many things, garlic cross-reacts with many things. So for some people, we will neutralize those three antigens, we call it MOG, and give them, and what we're treating really is food, and, you know, but a lot of people look at me kind of strange when I think, oh, we ought to test you for mesquite. And they're like, I don't like mesquite flavoring and we don't have mesquite here in this area. And that's true that the jet stream, every once in a blue moon will bring mesquite pollen over from the desert Southwest, but that's pretty rare. So for the most part, we don't have it here, but mesquite is, is kind of called a universal antigen because it, it's like a skeleton key, it cross reacts with, with so many different things. But um, that, that's yet another layer of complexity where depending on what the person can react to, the pollens that are in the air that day that might be cross-reactive with the foods that they may have eaten that day, all of this is playing a role. You know, so anytime we're seeing something, it's like, I felt good last week, but this week something's wrong. I'm thinking, did they sensitize to something new or is it this concomitancy of now, you know, like I actually noticed yesterday, juniper's coming out now. So the, the primary pollen yesterday and probably today is juniper. So for anyone who's sensitive to juniper, they may have felt good two weeks ago when we were still kind of in weed season. But now that juniper's coming, and juniper really does tear people up, but um, you know, these are all the factors that I'm thinking of if someone comes to me and says, you know, I'm getting lousy or I've got a headache or something like this. It's, it's all of these things that are kind of going through my head. Um, lots of questions. But um, do certain things cause certain allergic reactions? Like you mentioned joint pain. Initially, you talked about headache. You mentioned rash. So does one thing cause a rash and another thing cause a headache? Not to my knowledge. Like okay. I, I think like ragweed for some people might just cause primarily sinus congestion. But for someone else, it could cause their joint pain or the air fatigue. And, then, and another important point is allergy is not just watery nose runny eyes it can create any symptom you can think of uh, you know from fatigues to skin rashes to headaches to i mean just we don't put anything past it and that shocks a lot of people because you know the predominant wisdom out there is that allergy is just runny nose sneezing and watery eyes it's a lot more than that there was a a book that was last published it's out of print now called Allergy of the Nervous System, and it was edited by a doctor named Frederick Speer. It's fascinating. The entire book basically is how the allergic phenomenon can affect the brain and can affect mood, mentation, behavior. Um, the, and 
a lot of the references in that book are actually from the late 1800s. Like they really understood a lot of this way back then. As we got more into the pharmaceutical era, all that got swept under the rug, and it's not even taught in medical schools these days. I wasn't taught any of this stuff in medical school. It's all, you know, what drug are you going to throw? What condition? But, so, but yeah, I, I don't. It, actually, I would like it if it was that specific, because you know, oh, you got a rash. That's that. You know, yeah, it, yeah. It can be anything. Yeah. Question. Can you speak to how allergies, whether it be an inhaler or uh, pollen or food allergy, affects children? We see mood swings in, in children. I have three kids, and I can tell a difference sometimes when they eat specific things. It, and yeah, kind of back to that, and, and even back to that book, um, there's a phenomenon that I had never heard of before I joined this practice called the allergic tension fatigue syndrome. And in fact, in, in that book, The Allergy of the Nervous System, there's an entire chapter on the allergic tension fatigue syndrome. The, what this is, is an allergic phenomenon, so the person is reacting to something, be it a food, be it a pollen, whatever, but it's manifesting more in mood, mentation, and behavior, and the, the tension component is kind of a tendency to overdo, overreact, it's a hyperactivity, a lot of what we would call ADHD, ADD is actually that. The fatigue component is just the opposite. It can be just, uh, you know, just I don't feel good, I can't concentrate. Um, me growing up being a severe allergy patient, after I was finally treated here and my allergy extract had, had made such a difference for me, I realized how lousy I felt almost all my life growing up. And for me, it really was the fatigue component. It's like, I felt like I slept good, I'm doing everything right, I, you know, and yet I just, can't I'm just in a fog I just don't feel good and that evaporated when when I, that was an allergic phenomenon baker's yeast for me actually um, and this was kind of funny so when I was doing my testing here the tester at that time was a lady named Ann and she had been here for 20 years she, she has since retired but being here for 20 years I mean she had seen it all as it comes to reactions that can happen you know in the testing and symptoms that it can provoke and so we were going to test some of my foods and same thing, they said, what do you crave? I said, I'm a foodie, what do I not crave? I like everything, you know. So I wrote out a list of maybe 20 different major foods in the diet that we wanted to look at. And she said, I'm gonna test you blind, because I don't, I, you know, you'll know what we're doing, you just don't, you won't know at the time what is what. So yeah, that's fine. So some things are rolling in, some things are rolling out. Unfortunately, coffee and chocolate rolled in. I said, just put that in my extract, because I'm not giving it up. Um, <laughs> so she got to something, put it down my skin, and I mean, within two, three minutes, I was like, just totally in a fog, you know, and I looked at her, I said, Ann, I mean, honestly, was that Valium? Like, what, what, what was that, you know? And she laughed, she said, that was baker's yeast. And I said, well, that's kind of what I feel like, like if we eat at Olive Garden, she said, yep, yeah, yeah, that you're, you're, ha you're reacting to it, you're having an immune, reaction, but it wasn't runny nose, watery eyes. It was just a profound sense of, of uh, brain fog and, and just kind of like fatigue. But um, that's actually, if, if I remember correctly, one of the things that got Dr. Lieberman into this kind of practice is being a pediatrician for 16 years. He said, we weren't really seeing a lot of ADD, ADHD back in the 50s, 60s. And then by the time we're getting into the 70s, it was like every third kid that came into the office was off the chart and he was putting them on Ritalin. And then he went to an environmental medicine conference and Billy Crook was lecturing. And Billy said, uh, gentlemen, uh, you know, he was talking about the allergic tension fatigue syndrome. And he said, I'm sure you've noticed that with some of your ADHD patients, if you treat their allergies, the ADHD goes away. And Dr. Lieberman looked at him and he, he said, boo and the guy sitting next to him tapped him on the shoulder and says, Doctor, have you tried this yet? He said, no. He said, well, don't knock it till you try it. Okay, so he came back to Charleston and started sending some of his ADHD patients, if they even look like they may also be allergic, to another allergist at that time to be treated. And sure enough, with a lot of these patients, if you treated the allergies, the mentation issues went away. And so that really, like, totally clued him in that, that some, that, Allergy affects mood, behavior, concentration, all of that, and uh, sometimes in a really big way. Red dye number 40, which I don't want anyone to be exposed to anyway, 
that comes up being an issue for hyperactivity in children so common I can't even begin to tell you. And I had a family that I'm um, talking about the, the they, they brought their child in mainly for more of a natural treatment for a, you know, ADHD, ADD. And I'm talking to him about foods and everything, and I could tell the dad was just really not buying it. He was just kind of mm, rolling his eyes and everything. But <laughs> I was just kind of begging him, you know, to do a whole foods diet, you know, real food. So get rid of the Skittles, get rid of the Doritos, get rid of the Kool-Aid or whatever. I said, fine, you know, that's a smart thing to do anyway. So when they came back in for the follow-up, the dad looked at me and said, I kind of have to apologize. He said, I thought you were crazy. <laughs> well, we did your recommendations anyway. Son dramatically improved. I mean, basically the, the ADD vanished. And what finally sealed the deal was he went, after he was better, he went to a friend's birthday party and he had the red velvet cake and the red Kool-Aid and he exploded. He was like the Tasmanian devil for about a day. And dad said, after I saw that, I was convinced. You know, off the Red 40, no ADD. On the Red 40, Tasmanian devil. So, you know. Can you explain why you mentioned that you were an allergic child and you had had all kinds of testing? What was different about the testing here? I mean, because you'd already been treated for allergies, but it wasn't effective until you tried this. Well, and, and I think there were, there were probably two things that played into that. So um, we do use a different technique. I, th I think most of you hopefully would, are pretty familiar with the technique, but our technique here, when we're doing the testing, we're doing intradermal testing, which is more sensitive than scratch or prick. So it's it's a it's a better way to test. And then with anything that we test that wheels, we're then going to try to find the dose of that same thing that doesn't wheel. So we're looking for the non-wheeling dose. Part of what we think is happening at that level is that the immune system is basically constantly communicating amongst itself throughout the body with hormones which are called cytokines. Cytokines and, and interleukins. Interleukin literally means the white blood cells are leukocytes, so interleukin. So it's, they gave it that name to mean these are the hormones that they're communicating with. And it, and again, it's so complex, It's a, they're, they're finding new cytokines, new interleukins, new types of cells all the time. It's, it's just absolutely fascinating. But to make it way oversimplified, you can think that some of these cytokines and interleukins are activators. So they're going to tell the immune system, we've got a foreign invader, we're under attack, rev up, go, you know, call out the troops, go on the attack and, and form the reaction. And then you've got other cytokines that basically say, all's clear, we're good, chill out, nothing to see here. So we think what's happening is at a provoking dose, at a wheeling dose, you're releasing activator cytokines. You're telling the immune system, we've got an enemy, go on the attack. At the non-wheeling dose, we're probably releasing these all clear cytokines that tell the rest of the immune system, uh, you know what, we do have dust mite here, but it's just dust mite, it's no big deal, chill out. And so releasing these, the and suppressor is probably not a good word because we're not really suppressing the immune system, but we're just chilling it out. So if you treat someone at that dose, it makes all the difference in the world. It's, it's a much more kinder, gentler way of doing allergy treatment because it should never provoke a dose. It's safe enough to do it at home. So we actually mix our formulas up, send it with the person. So that's, that's why we don't ask people to come here every week for the shots. It's safe enough to do it at home. Um, so, it, and it really, and of course I'm biased, but I really think it works so much better than the escalation therapy. The, the kind of traditional way of doing allergy treatment is to do panel testing or scratch testing or, or prick testing where they're doing many different things as a panel all at once, normally on the patient's back. They'll take which of those things wheel up, put those in the allergy extract that they're going to treat. They're going to start with a very low dose of that extract and then increase the concentration over time. And that's why they want the patient to come to the office usually, because every time you go up, you could cause anaphylaxis. And so they want to observe the patient, make sure that, you know, so usually you'll get the shot, wait 20, 30 minutes, and then they, you know, let you go on your way. That technique does work. So I don't, I don't even want to suggest that it doesn't, but it looks like you have to run the gauntlet to get to a high enough concentration or something called energy occurs, which is also called clonal deletion, where the body literally stops making 
the white blood cells that respond to that antigen. So you've got to run that gauntlet. So with me, I did allergy shots, traditional escalation allergy shots for about 12 years growing up. Still was a train wreck with all kinds of allergies and everything. And I think there were two variables in that. One, I may have never made it to that magical point, and I still had dairy in my diet every single day. And so I think if I had taken dairy out, maybe it would have worked better. Maybe I would have got to the end point. Um, I was very skeptical when I came here when I first met Dr. Lieberman because, you know, having been through allergy shots for 12 years, we were walking through this room and I stopped him and I said, listen, no offense, I'm not saying allergy treatment doesn't work, but it, it just never worked for me. And he said, this is a de you know different technique. Don't knock it till you try it. After he hired me, he actually said for the next three days, just feel free to come in here in a t-shirt because you're just gonna sit in the allergy room. I wanna get 20, 30 things to put in your extract. I'm gonna cure your allergies. And I thought, great. You know, and in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, eh, I don't think it's gonna work. But <laughs> I was shocked. I mean, literally within three months of being on, on these shots, I felt better than I felt in my entire life and could, could hold and pet my neighbor's cat and not explode into hives and everything. And that, that was really kind of one of the final pieces of the puzzle that I was like, holy cow, like, you know, this really works. So, so um, is this a lifetime that you take these In, in my opinion, no. And I'm, I'm saying that, um, kind of based on about the two dozen patients that I've seen so far that, and, and for each of these, I'm wondering how many people am I not seeing that would come in and say something like, I saw Dr. Lehman 30 years ago. I did my extract. I was completely cured after a period of time. So much so that I forgot to do the extract, went years without it, sometimes went decades without it, with no problems. Now I think my allergies are starting to come back I know what it is. I want to get in here and nip it in the bud. And I literally have, have had like two dozen patients that that was the case. So I wonder how many patients are out there that are still cured and still, you know, don't need us. And mm -hmm. it ranges the, the quickest I've ever seen. I had one patient that literally within three months, they felt like they were a hundred percent. And they said, I'm going to stop taking the extra. I said, it's a little early. Most people need, I'd say a year, year and a half of being on it before they truly get tolerance back. And the patient said, well, I mean, I, I feel fine. You know what? If the symptoms come back, I'll just restart the extra. I said, okay, that's a fair enough argument. And I said, will you just stay in touch with me? I mean, you can just send me an email or something. Just let me know. And this has been four years now, and they're fine. You know, so that's the quickest I've ever seen. If, if we're getting, so the total load, this is another very important phenomenon to keep in mind. But I think of allergies... Um, one analogy that I use is like if, if I went out in my backyard and built a bonfire on the lawn, of course it would scorch the lawn. If I wanted to get the lawn back looking like nothing had ever happened, you'd have to put the fire out. You've got to put it all the way out. You've got to keep it all the way out long enough for new grass to regrow. And eventually it would look like nothing had ever happened. So from an allergic standpoint, let's say someone's allergic to 50 things and you're treating them for 10. They might feel a little bit better, maybe. If you're treating them for 25, they should notice that something's better. If you treat them for all 50, they should get 100% better. So if I've got someone that they've been on the extract for quite a while and, and, they're, and they're better, but we're not cured, I always think we're missing something. And it could be other allergens, or it could even, you know, and again, it could be a food that's such a hidden, thing like me with dairy that we don't even suspect it's a problem, but it's, it's keeping the immune system revved up. Um, stress, unfortunately, plays into it. Almost all of those two dozen patients who have come back for retreatment after they have been good for so long, once I finally kind of real, because one of them one day said, I was fine until I went through my divorce. And I went through all this stress, and then all of a sudden it's like my allergies are starting to come back. and. Nine times out of 10, it seems like it's a major stressor, which I think just kind of discombobulates the immune system, causes leaky gut, revs up everything, you know, causes problems. So you know, back to stress, stress is just a killer, but yeah. I'm wondering kind of at the, 
the end result. So when you take a patient and you test for different types of food problems and you take out the red dye and you look at the major food allergens and you figured out what they can't have, do you ever take what they can have and kind of make meal plans? We try to. Um, we've been looking for a nutritionist now for years actually because we so feel like I. that's that's such an important part of the practice um, that we really would like to have a full-time nutritionist that could truly focus nothing on but making sure for this person this is what we're going to do with the diet and all that kind of stuff we just haven't found that yet but um, and I, I really I don't necessarily want people to be on a restricted diet if they don't need to be, you know, so so normally if, if we've established foods that are an issue, um, yeah, okay, I mean, those have to go for at least a period of time. Um, some foods, I believe, like gluten and dairy can be a fixed issue. Like with me, even though I didn't react to dairy allergy-wise, I still put it in my extract. It didn't seem to make a difference. Um, I almost think of it like a celiac disease phenomenon where celiac, that's a genetic condition, they're never going to be okay with gluten. Gluten has to come out of their diet forever and ever. Amen. But I've had other people that were not celiac, like biopsy proven, labs negative, not celiac, who still knew they reacted to gluten. Some of those people we could desensitize and then they were okay. With gluten. Whether you want to argue if gluten is ever okay, and that, that's a sticky situation. But um, So in general, if, if we've either treated it or gotten it to the point where we feel like, okay, now you are tolerant to these foods and, and doing just fine with them, not having any complaints. I'll try to get the diet, you know, I, and I'm still, I'm begging people to eat, you know, all the colors in the rainbow and vegetables as often as they can, not Skittles, vegetables, um, and, you know, whole foods, um, being careful with processed food, stuff like that. But in general, I want, I was listening to another webinar and, and functional medicine doctor out in California was talking about an issue that I've seen very often, which is once you've identified that there's, you know, food issues, taking those foods out of the diet, sometimes people end up on a very restricted diet, which then they can sometimes sensitize to those foods. And, and now, you know, what are you left with? The microbiome, it looks like the diversity of the microbiome, which has so much to do with teaching the immune system what to do and what not to do, is determined a lot by foods and by different foods and so he was saying that he sees people where they go on these really restricted diets that thins out the microbiome that further affects the immune system and kind of a tiger by the tail and so what he was doing with his patients is saying go to the grocery store get as many different colors of as many different vegetables of things that you seem to do okay with as you can go home, put them in a blender, drink them, all these different vegetable prebiotic fibers are then gonna nourish the microbiome, which is then gonna teach the immune system what to do and kind of keep it on track. And he's calling that the microbiome diversity diet. And that makes a, a lot of sense to me. So I, I really think having diversity in the diet of lots of healthy foods is kind of the way we should all be you know, eating. So. Do you think with all the food chemicals, things that they're putting in our foods now, that our bodies are reacting to those foods. The case in, with me, um, this has been like 20 some years ago, I went to IHOP, which I'm going to go to IHOP now. <laughs> but I had the pumpkin pancakes. I took my husband there for three mm -hmm. days. So we're sitting there eating pumpkin pancakes and I almost passed out mm -hmm. just after a few bites. And I'm like, whoa, what's wrong? So I didn't, you know, wonder what it was, but didn't have to go to the doctor or anything. And so come Thanksgiving, had pumpkin pie, mm -hmm. I thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to end If mom didn't have the STCF drops from Dr. Lieberman, I think I'd end up in the emergency room. I blew up so big. I felt so sick. And my, you know, another doctor told me that it was the chemical, because they don't use pumpkin mm -hmm. in their pancakes, let's be almost done. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but the body thought that you know, it was the same thing. Is that mm -hmm. possible? I mean, do you think? The, the problem really, yes, I guess is the short answer, uh -huh. but um, Theron Randolph, who's really the, the father of environmental medicine, he was an orthodox allergist, 
and one of the first people that started to realize, hey, maybe food is more than just calories. Like maybe people can react to foods and all this. That got him ostracized from, I think he was at the University of Chicago and they basically kind of kicked him off staff. So he just went into private practice. But um, back when he was dealing with patients in the 50s, the foods were a lot purer back then. We didn't have as many chemicals to deal with and everything. So, so the, the food reactivity and food issues that he was seeing when he was initially studying it, and uh, another allergist, Albert Rowe, was arguably the first person to publish an entire book on food allergy way back when. They were really just dealing with the food. Not only is that issue still present today, but it's compounded by artificial dyes, artificial colorings, preservatives, Roundup, you know, all the synthetic stuff that's in there. I, this is my opinion. But I think part of the reason we're seeing so much issue with wheat now is because we've hybridized the wheat and because if it's not organic, they've sprayed Roundup on the wheat. And so I, I'm seeing people that, you know, are say in their 60s, 70s, 80s, they've been fine with bread all their life up until just the last few years. So I think it's something that's changed in the food supply. But we have a number of people that are also watching this. This is on Facebook Live, and there was a very similar question um, yeah. that someone asked about food additives. Okay. So, um, Axa Carnes um, is live now with us. She wants to know, she said, isn't natural additives generally made from soy? Yeah, yes, and a lot of other stuff. And in, in fact, I get spooked anytime on the ingredients. If I see natural flavors, that's usually MSG. You know, natural ingredients, natural anything. When you see natural, that could be a red, could be a red flag. So, very and frustrating. She also wanted to know of the tests that you mentioned, which one is your favorite? You know, you to use to test patients. I I like the the and currently we're using all tests um, for the food IgG mm -hmm. panel. Um, every functional medicine company in existence can do a food IgG panel. You know, Genova Doctors Data, Biotech, Dunwoody, Cyrex, you name it. Um, really, it's just kind of differing in what they're test and the cost and everything. But so far, we've been very pleased with all tests. But because this is the delayed reactions that can fool elimination diets, this has kind of become my go-to. And even then, I don't. I don't recommend it for every patient or all the time necessarily, but it's wonderful for like headaches, skin issues, skin rashes. Um, I'm usually giving people a copy of the Institute for Functional Medicine's Comprehensive Elimination Diet and thinking about doing this because these are the things that the elimination diet might miss. And, and normally with that, we can cover the basis. The, the IgE reactions are easy to figure out because they're immediate. You know, those are no brainers. Um, I don't do a lot of the mediator release test, nothing against that test, but quite often that mechanism is also relatively quick onset and can be figured out clinically. And so I don't tend to order that one as, as often because there's other ways we can figure it out. Patient wants to know, are you do you are you testing for leaky gut before treating the allergy? Not necessarily. And and actually back back to all tests. The food IgG, I consider a indirect measurement of leaky gut because to get the food IgG antibodies, you've got to get the food intact into the bloodstream. And so I kind of use, um, let's say you've done like a, I think they do, what is it, a 94 and 186 food panel or whatever. Mm -hmm. Let's just say you've done the 94 food panel and 70 of them are positive. That's a leaky gut, you know, whereas if you do the 90 food panel and it's negative, which which has happened. I've had people. This came in. It was it was fine, and I said that surprises me, but I'm glad. You know, we just kind of ruled this mechanism out for the most part. Um, I'm just assuming. Well, and I guess I should say we all have leaky gut. They found out it's a normal physiologic reaction. So, and it varies from day to day based on what we're eating and our stress levels and all that kind of stuff. But what we're really talking about is the degree of permeability. You know, so again, if the cells are like that, that's as good as it gets. If they're like that, bigger things can get through if they're like that. You know, so it's really just the degree of permeability. But I'm usually with anyone with, with you know, allergies, chemical sensitivities, kind of 
an immune an autoimmunity and immune system that's doing something weird. I'm just assuming it's there. And then usually walking through those four R's, you know, the remove, replace, re-inoculate, and repair, to just start working on it anyway. And I personally, I think leaky gut can be addressed very quickly because with me, when I let myself get into dairy, if I if and if I flare, which normally is two to three days later, mm -hmm. I'll put the the L glutamine, the restorer, and the George's aloe back in my sub. You know, I'll take them morning and night, and I usually can put a flare up out now in about two to four days if I do that. And so I think you can fix leaky gut very quickly if you remove the underlying cause and use some of the stuff that can, that can seal it. So. I think I heard you say um, asthma in the beginning. Is there a correlation with the allergy and asthma? Oh, definitely. Definitely. You, um, um, I, I would say allergy might actually be the number one cause of what we would call asthma because it's um, inflammation usually in the medium and lower level bronchioles. And then the question is, what's causing that inflammation? And so there can be toxic insults that would do that and even like particulate things like coal dust, you know, which I wouldn't call an allergy necessarily, but by far and away, you know, we're seeing dust. It's probably a major, major contributing factor. Pet danders, um, alternaria, which is an airborne mold, is a documented major, major trigger for asthma. But um, so, so with asthma, reactive airway disease, I'm always looking to see well, what are this person's major triggers, and then if it's something we can avoid, let's avoid it. If it's something we can't avoid, like dust or pollens, then let's treat it you know, with immunotherapy. And would the asthma go away if you find the allergy? I think so. In in almost all cases, if if we if we wrap up all the underlying causes, then we get great results with that. Um, you're talking about the. Uh, putting uh, all the vegetables in the blender. Mm -hmm. Can you mix fruit with that? I would think so. I, you know, I would, I, I would try to find some way to, <laughs> to, to make it taste good. But <laughs> the, the concept that he was talking about just made a lot of sense to me because um, kind of going back to that company biome, it's starting to be studied now of, of like what supplements and what foods mainly benefit different families of, of bacteria, which is, uh, I don't know why it kind of intrigues me, but when you think about like a, a family of bacteroides might prefer these vegetable fiber foods as their favorite foods versus like lactobacillus might prefer something a little bit different. Interestingly enough, some of the not so good species, what, what feeds lactobacillus, they don't like it. So you, you can literally boost your good guys and, and lessen your not so good guys with, with food and nutrition. It's really complex, but it's an area that they're studying more and more. And he was just saying, there are all these vegetable fibers in there. Yeah. Get that diversity back up. So. Yeah. Sounds like a good idea. You've spoken several times about fibers, and I know we can try to find the most natural um, products that you can and try to do things with food, but I know you're also recommending the microbiome defense now. Yep. I think that's konjac root. What is it about certain fibers of the body or or, or fiber people that be more sensitive? Or? Uh, well, I guess, and to break it down, they're soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. And they're both good. They both do different things. Fiber in general um, kind of acts like roughage and, and can help us move things through and, you know, keep things regular and keep, you know, flushing bad stuff out of the body. So, so that's good. But then again, the different bacteria it looks like we'll prefer certain ones. And, um, back to L-glutamine for a second. So L-glutamine is thought to be the number one nutrient to support the cells, mainly in the small intestine. It's their preferred fuel. So like if you gave the cell glucose or L-glutamine, so which one do you want? It's going to take the L-glutamine. We think it's doing that to spare the glucose, because so the gut doesn't suck up all our glucose that we're eating, and less of it will get you know into the body. So the beneficial species of, of bacteria can make L-glutamine in response to certain vegetable fibers, and we think this is just kind of the natural way it's meant to be, where healthy microbiome, we're eating vegetables, the vegetable fibers 
feed the good bacteria and they metabolize it, they produce L-glutamine. L-glutamine nourishes the gut border, which should look like shag carpet. If, if you looked at it under a microscope, it has villi that are sticking into the, to the lumen of the gut, and that increases the surface area in the gut dramatically. And in a lot of conditions, if you're losing those villi, you know, you're losing a lot of surface area, you're losing areas where, where digestion is supposed to take place, food's going straight through, that leads to malnutrition, nutrient deficiency, stuff like that. So we really, we want to nourish that gut. We want those villi, we want that ecosystem to be really healthy. And we think that's kind of, that's just how it's supposed to be. You know, healthy bacteria, lots of vegetable fiber, they make things that nourish us, and then they have a nice environment that nourishes them, and it's a happy little ecosystem. But, uh, but as they study it, all these different fibers slightly do different things, so they're kind of all good. And, uh, yeah. So is the L-glutamine something that's manufactured in the body, or is that something that's in foods? So it's an amino acid, so it's in almost any kind of protein to, to some level, um, but it is, it can be made by the bacteria, so I don't, and off the top of my head, I can't remember if it's an, so we, we can't really make amino acids, but the liver can take certain amino acids and make other amino acids out of them. Um, so I'm not sure if that's one that can be converted from others or, or not, but the bacteria, certain bacteria we know can make it. So. All right, lunchtime. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.